The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome. Any visitors, we are grateful to have you here to worship with us at Southside Bible Church. Uh, Just a reminder, this Friday and Saturday there will be a women's retreat and just ask all of you to be praying for that time. I think there's a hundred ladies who will be gathering to study the Word of God on, on control and how to surrender that to the Lord. So let's just be praying and asking God to meet all the women during that time and excited for them to have that together. Well, this morning we're going to be partaking of communion together. By God's providence, we find ourselves in a passage in Second Peter that will prepare our, health, our hearts well for the table of remembrance. So if you'll turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 19, but I'm going to read all the way through verse 21. <clears throat> Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory... This is my beloved Son in who I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you that you have given us an inspired word. It is God breathed. We thank you that as we study this and labor in it, we are laboring in the words of God, your revelation to us. And so I pray that every heart would be attentive to every detail of this word, that they might know you, that they might know the way you have revealed yourself as a saving God, a God who takes sinners from all walks of life and brings them to yourself in a saving, loving relationship. And so we thank you for this gospel, and we thank you for Peter and what we've been learning in this journey, and I pray this morning that your spirit would now illuminate them to every mind and heart in this place. God, let us understand your heart and your intent and let it change lives this morning as we behold these truths. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Verse 16, for um, grammar teachers, you, you don't start with four. That's not how you begin a sentence. And so what, what is it? What is Peter doing? Well, it's explaining and he's further drawing out what we looked at the last time we were together in Peter last week when we looked at verses 12 through 15. We looked at Peter's ministry of remembrance. I will keep reminding you of the gospel again and again. I will sow it from every angle like this diamond that you just keep looking at and beholding it. You will become like him. And so to get these truths in your mind, into your heart, and into your will, to see a changed life, Peter's writing, he wants to give you the full assurance of faith So that when you get to verse 11, in this way, entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. To enter in in the fullness of abundance into the eternal kingdom. That's what we're working at. And so on this journey of faith, first epistle, you will remember, the world was persecuting this group of believers that had been spread abroad in Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia and all those areas. Well, in this letter now, false teachers are coming to lead them away from godliness and their true hope. They're coming and deceiving with a false teaching. They have a real devil. They have remaining flesh. They're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. And there's battles going on now in this church. And this is a very difficult path to glory. It's not designed to be a bed of roses. I don't know what you signed up for in American Christianity, but Jesus says there's a cost. You're going to take up your cross and you're going to carry it and follow Him to glory. It's a Calvary road to get to this beautiful reward for all of eternity. 
And so the question is, I, I need help to get to, as Bunyan said, the celestial city. God has given so much to us to get there. Like we saw in verse 1, the gift of faith. God has given to us the gift to believe this gospel. And He's given us fellowship with the divine nature. We have the ability now to come and partake and enjoy communion with God. And He's given us precious and magnificent promises that are just brimming with hope for the child of God. These are powerful. But what fuels them? How do I bank on them? How do I hold to them? With all these forces that are coming against me, I I need a foundation this morning. I need a guide. I need a lamp. I need a source of truth that I can run to with all of the air and deception being thrown at me all day long in this world. I need truth. I need absolute truth against all the lies that just keep coming from every angle. I need truth. Something that I can hang my hat on with all of these tempests. I heard a testimony in Sunday school, just I wanted truth. I need to bank everything for my eternal life on truth. So Peter's going to give that to us in this current section. This is why he keeps teaching and writing and reminding the believers of these truths that we saw in verses 1 through 11, because these teachings are that. I want you to hear this very clearly. They're truth from God. Truth from our God. Unchanging, faithful, trustworthy, eternal truth. Peter is saying what I'm giving to you, what I'm asking you to bank your eternal life on, to swim against the current of this world like a dolphin in the ocean, it better be a sure word. I can't sacrifice everything and endure the, all the hell that is set against me in this road to glory unless I have something so certain it can never fail, it can never let me down. I need that. You ever feel that way? cost is your life. You must lose your life in this world for Christ. And if I do that, it better be a sure word or I'm a fool. And I just think of all the cults just continuing to give us man's thoughts, their interpretations of history and where things are going, the the view, their understanding of the world's existence and what I think. Jehovah's Witness, there's a guy right next to my house that sits there every day all day in his wheelchair telling people a lie. I need something more than that. This morning, Peter's going to give us that. He's going to give us absolute truth that we can bank everything on. And I want to pray just one more time. Father, I thank you for this truth. I thank you that you gave us the Bible. And I'm afraid that it's become heirlooms in many of our lives. And I'm praying today that by your Spirit, oh God, that you would move in our hearts to show us again what it is we have in these Bibles. We have absolute truth and we have your word without error, perfect, preserved for us this morning so that we can know the mind of God. God, wake us up to this treasure of what you've given us in our Bibles. May they saturate our minds and our hearts and our wills. God, meet us now in the word of God and do what only you can do, we pray. Amen. Well, let's begin. Verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales. We made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter is going to address where all this is moving. He's going to address what, what is your hope? How does all of this end? Well, it ends in Christ being put on display for all the universe to marvel and worship His full glory forever and ever and ever. We'll never get tired of it. It's just going to be amazing to have that full glory no longer just with this little light that we have now called a Bible. We're just going to see Him in His blazing glory. And so if we're banking everything in this life on that, I'm giving up my money to that, my time, my talents, my hopes, what I pursue are all based on that finish line. Peter, he's saying it better not be a fable or a tale. That won't help me at all. I'm not giving my life to a made-up story is what he's telling his writers. So this isn't something somebody created in their imaginations. No way. 
I wouldn't call you to that is what Peter's saying. Therefore, Peter is now going to show them why he's fixing his hope in 1 Peter 1.13 with finality on the coming to you grace of God. The second coming, why he's fixed all of his hope on that day. The, the history, uh, he's saying in history, I'm an, I had an eyewitness account of Christ. Revelation is God-breathed. And it tells us that He's coming and He's going to sum up all things in Jesus Christ. That's how history is going to end. The, the Scriptures are declaring it and showing it forth. And so this morning, we're going to take up the history. And we're going to look at Peter's firsthand eyewitness of this glory of Christ. And then next week, we'll go to the special revelation, this inspired Word that has been given to us to reveal these truths about our Christ. So let's look first. Verses 16 through 18 will take up our supernatural experience, our a supernatural experience that Peter had. So, what I'm teaching you, Peter's saying, I'm reminding you day and night, <coughs> they're not just tales or fables. I was an eyewitness of this glory. And so, like all the false teachers, they attack the ones who preach this word. And they say they're making it up. And, and we have the real truth. Muhammad had the truth. Mary Baker, Edie, Confucius, Joseph Smith. They have the real truth. The Bible's just made up stories that are impossible to have really happened. The, not in the day, the day of enlightenment that we live in. All the great science and technology, they, they laugh at you and say you're fools for believing this. Cru crucified and raised? Come on. It's all over our land, and unfortunately, it's all over our churches. Peter is being attacked that you're teaching tales and myths that are just made up. And he's going to take their attack and he's just going to blow it out of the water in the next two weeks. And he, he did it in one writing. I'm not that good. So if you will come with me to our text. I didn't just give you cleverly devised tales. We got this Greek word, muthos, where we get the word myths. Uh, I didn't just come with these myths of all the Greek gods of that day where they would make up all these things that they did and how they gave birth to other gods and all of these things. I'm not bringing muthos, myths, to you. Whenever Paul used this Greek word, it always, every time, referred to false teachers. Timothy, in the end days, you're, they're going to accumulate teachers for themselves who will teach you myths, tales, fanciful stories. In Peter's day, there were all these myths about gods and how the world came into being. I was blown away this week looking at all the different views and the, they had explanations for why there were storms, why events happened. It was just all over this region with myths and fanciful stories and devised tales in his time. Very much alive in our own day and age. The story of the Bible are myths. The miracles are not true. Just, they're, they're really principles that are being taught. Modern theologians, they try to grab these principles from the Bible, but let's get rid of all that miraculous stuff, and we'll just call it myths. And let's just take the essential meanings of the stories, because no one in the 21st century can believe such fanciful stories. That's what's circulating in our country and all over uh, our churches. And so Peter just boldly says, guess what? These are not myths. What we saw was historical and real. And, and this morning, it happened to us on a mountain. The eyewitness to the unveiling of the glory of Christ where He pulled back this veil called humanity and gave us a glimpse of His deity. And what I've been teaching in verses 1 through 11 that Pastor Murphy just got stuck in, I just can't get over these truths in the Gospel. It's not embellished myths or tales. It's absolute truth. And that's what Peter wants us to get into our hearts this morning and into our minds. So listen to what he says in verse 16. When we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is now the second coming of Christ, when he will come and, and that we'll have the culmination of all things, Jesus is the end of all of history. And in Ephesians it says it will be the summing up of all things in Christ Jesus. And so all of history is moving to His full glory, just being displayed forever and ever and ever. That's where all of this is going to end. 
And when we told you about this, it was not a myth. It wasn't to get your money. It wasn't to take advantage of you like these false teachers. When we tell you about His power and His glory, I'm not talking about His first coming. His first coming is He came in humility like a lamb. And He died as a sinner uh, for us in our place on a cross and He accomplished salvation. But He's going to come again. And this time He's going to come as a lion and He's going to come full of glory and power, undiminished. The first coming, His Lordship was resisted. At the second coming, none will be able to resist the King. And so Peter chooses this word for coming as parousia. And parousia, uh, this word, every time it's used in the Greek New Testament, it always refers to His second coming. In Matthew 24, he speaks of it four times. Greg's teaching in 1 Thessalonians, uh, four times as well, this parousia. And what he's telling you is this, this is not a myth. This is not a myth. Listen, I'm just going to read to you some of the verses that Peter wrote in his first epistle about this. He said in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the second coming when he returns. 1 Peter 1, 13, Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When he returns, set your hope on that day. 1 Peter 4, 13, To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation when He comes back and reveals it all. In 1 Peter 5.10, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you on that last day. So how do we know that this is not just a fable made up by some Galilean fishermen? And Peter tells you this morning, we, the apostles, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We saw it. <laughs> majesty, it's really untranslatable, and it has this preposition, mega. Mega majesty. We saw the full glory of God in the face of Christ. It means splendor, majesty, grandeur, or glory. We saw it. Peter, when did you see it? What's Peter talking about? Well, it's a time, he says in our verse this morning, when the Father testified to who He was. He said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so we see that happened at the Jordan River and another time, but at the Transfiguration, it happened on a holy mountain. And from the context, it's very clear. Uh, I didn't have one commentator disagree that this was the Transfiguration the day those three were on the mountain. So I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 9, and we're going we're gonna to go back to this experience to just see it again, and then we'll bring it back into our context to see why is Peter bringing this up at this point in his letter. <clears throat> the context in Luke 9 is they're journeying to glory. Uh, he's trying to help the, the disciples and the apostles in, in knowing how to journey, and same with Peter's context. So as we come, why am I on this journey why, why am I on this journey? And it's a fundamental commit, conviction that you must have. Flip back to Luke 9, verse 18. Verse 18. And it happened that while Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with Him. And He questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. But others, that, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God, the, the Messiah. And so this is why I'm on this journey. This is what the whole Testament has been promising and prophesying and telling us. And Peter says, you're that one. You're the Messiah. You're God's promised one, the anointed one. Why are we on this journey? Because of who Jesus is. And I'm, gonna, I'm on this journey because of the Messiah that has come into the world. Well, where is it going? Look in verse 21. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Where this is leading is to the creator of the universe is going to be rejected. And he's going to be put up on a cross and he's going to die. And he's going to be buried. And he's going to be raised on the third day to bring about salvation, to bring about redemption for us. So you are the Lord's Messiah. Um, where is it going? To? He's going to the cross. He's going to bring about salvation. And this journey is going to end for Jesus with hatred and persecution, and it's going to do the same for you. So why is my, what is my commitment then to be on this journey? Look with me in verse 23. And he was saying to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I don't know a better message for the American church. You want to follow me? Come die. Take up your cross and follow after me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who's going to save it. For what does a man profit if he gains the whole world? Jesus didn't come to give you the whole world. What if you get the whole world and you forfeit your soul? You lose it on the way. Forever is ashamed of me and my words. The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And so my commitment is I die and my life is for Jesus Christ and I'm going to follow after him over anything else. Why? Well, where does it end? Well, in verse 27. I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This is in every account of all the gospel writers of the transfiguration. It begins with that, that you're going to see the kingdom of God, some of you, before you die. And so that's what's going to happen on this holy mountain. They're going to see the kingdom of God. They're going to see the king in all of his glory. Uh, so he will show them uh, the glory of this person. So I want you to look with me in verse 28. Some eight days after these sayings, so he's going to connect it right away. Eight days later, he took along Peter and John and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. And I think that Moses is representing the law, and Elijah is representing the prophets. And so here they are now, and they're, they're talking. And, and it says uh, in verse 31, appearing in glory, they were speaking of his departure, which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. And so they're talking about the cross and what he's going to go do to, to fulfill the law and the prophets and to bring about salvation. And so he's going to come and he's going to fulfill all that Moses wrote of and all that the prophets spoke of. He's the fulfillment and they're talking about how and it's going to happen at the cross. And so here's this glorious climactic moment in history. And in verse 32, Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. That wasn't the first or the last time. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as, as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying. It's just stupid. <laughs> Let me build tabernacles for you. And I've heard a hundred reasons. I still don't even know why. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered into the cloud. And then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. This is my Messiah. This is the chosen one that I've been writing through these prophets and telling you would come into this world. This is him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. And so they saw what Isaiah saw. They saw what Stephen saw in Acts 7. They saw what Saul saw on the road to Damascus. They saw what John saw on Patmos when he fell as a dead man. It's the resurrected glory of Christ. And it's that glory that he will shine when he comes back at his second coming. And so here it is, flip back to 2 Peter. The Word of God 
tells us of the triumphant Christ that's going to come back to earth to establish his kingdom in complete victory. And it's why many of them missed his first coming. They were expecting the second coming. And he's going to come back and it's going to be so glorious, so glorious, mega glorious. And Peter's saying, I saw that glory. I looked at it with my own eyes. I was sitting on a mountain and it got transfigured right before me. And it's amazing and it's beautiful. This is not a fable. This is not a story. I gazed at it. I looked right into it. He was transfigured before my very eyes. I testify of this glorious Christ. It is worth the journey. I'm going to watch my wife be crucified. I'm just going to watch it for the name of Christ, and then I will be crucified upside down for the name of Christ. How do you do that, Peter? How can you be that certain to go hang on a cross for the name of Jesus Christ? I saw it. I saw his glory. I know this is real. I know this is him. I will go die on a cross for the beautiful glory of what Christ has done and what he will do. I was there. I saw it. And what is more, he'll tell us next week, is the Word of God declares it to be so. The Word of God has said, this is it. This is what I will do. And now i got to watch it. i got to watch the fulfillment of the whole law and the prophets right here, transfigured. Moses and Elijah talking about what he's going to do. I looked at it. In verse 19, we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Next week, we're going to unpack these. I just want to touch, as we kind of close this morning and we go to the table, corporately as the body of Christ, to remember the great sacrificial death of this one that was transfigured that day. This is what Moses and Elijah were talking about, what we will remember this morning of what he did to accomplish our salvation. So Peter's going to pick a picture for us. And it's it's a picture of nighttime. And as we think about this world, remember in Isaiah, when I preached in Isaiah 9, it said the world sat in darkness. It's the same today. It just sits in darkness. It doesn't get it. It doesn't understand anything. It's just, it can't figure out. It sees some of the problems. It just can't fix it. It just sits in darkness. It sits in verse 4 of chapter 1, the corruption. Remember he says the corruption, we've escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Everybody just chasing their desires, their epithumias. It's just so broken and dark. And, and we've been called out, he said, and we've been given faith in these great promises. But there's so many temptations to throw us off this path. Our only hope uh, is to survive is our faith. Faith is it. Faith in, in what though? <laughs> And I want you to get this is faith flourishes in truth. And we're told today, I just turn my brain off. All I do is believe. And this whole Bible says that, that knowledge is what feeds faith. The Word of God, understanding it, looking at it, reading, it, it feeds and it fuels faith. And so faith flourishes in truth. And it's the only way that we can survive in this darkness is by way of a lamp. I can't get there by my own reasoning. There's a way that seems right to a man, in the end it leads to death. I need something to help me in this day of darkness to journey to my true home of where my God is. And it's a lamp called the prophetic word of God. (laughs) We've been given a lamp, church of God. A precious lamp that's infallible and points to this Jesus Christ and puts him on display from every page of the book. We've been given a lamp to guide us to glory. And it sits on lampstands. It sits on bedposts. This book reveals Jesus Christ. And it tells us there's going to be a second coming. And there's going to be a culmination of His glory in many different ways, but it's going to be put on display forever and ever and ever. Guys, this is the hope of the church. This is what we have put our faith in. And we've got to keep our eyes on this. Amen? It's so hard to keep my eyes on this with all the darkness. And so it just keeps saying, don't fall asleep. Don't let the bridegroom come back and you be drowsy and sleeping. 
Don't get led astray by false teachers. You can live any way you want. It doesn't matter. Don't get drawn into this world that puts all of its hope and epithumias in the scene of this world's going to make me happy. This is where my pleasure's at. Do not get drawn into that. But hold up this light. And look at His first coming. Don't forget the cross. Never take your eyes off of this Christ. That's what we're going to remember this morning. This first coming that this Word reveals to me what Jesus did to bring about my salvation. Cross. And don't become short-sighted and forget it. And forget the forgiveness of your sins. And then hold it up in the darkness of the future. Hold it out there, guys. And see the promise of this glory that's going to come in power and majesty. It's going to come again. Maybe this day. And until that day, this lamp will guide us into that day. He gave us a lamp to get to this day. He says, when the morning star rises and the blazing glory replaces the sun, it's going to be like the noonday sun and there'll be no more night and we'll see everything fully and truly as it is. And so we're, we're waiting for this day when it just the sun comes back. All of the radiance of His glory. And when that comes back, boom, I'll see everything perfectly. This is so beautiful. And it's so sure, so sure that Peter was an eyewitness in history. He looked right into this glory and he saw it. And he said, man, I, I looked at it and it's going to come back and it's glorious and it's beautiful and it's lovely and I will go to a cross for this Christ. And then it's in the sure word of God next week that what we hold here in these Bibles is God's word. And God has testified he will come again. And Peter says, so what manner of people ought we to be then? If Jesus and all that glory is going to come back, what kind of people should we be in holy conduct? Setting ourselves apart for this Christ day to day. Do you see the beauty of faith? To look at His first coming and to see what He did in my place. And faith to look at His second coming as my hope. This world isn't my hope. I just have faith every day. I hope this is the day. Come, Lord Jesus, take large strides. Return this day. This lamp is sufficient to reveal Christ and to give us all that we need for life and godliness until He comes. Isn't that what He said? This revelation of Christ in this Word is all that you need for life and godliness till He returns. We have everything that we need. Don't be looking for something else. You've got everything you need to make it to that day when the sun, the sun arises and boom, breaks in. Faith is the earnest, joyful expectation of Jesus coming to this earth. Come back. And so are you giving yourself to this Word? Are you giving yourself to the lamp in the darkness? Do you get your theology from movies or country songs? I have people say that all the time. I just believe what this guy wrote. I like to think that God is good. He's down below. He's up above. He's, he knows who is good and who doesn't. I don't even remember now. But don't get your theology from country singers. Goodness, we got a light. We got a light. And I look to get my understanding for everything, for life and godliness, to get to that day. And people are falling off all over the place because they're putting down the light, the lamp. You can't make it without the lamp. Some of you young ones going off to college, put the lamp away and you're done. Get the lamp out and get in that Word every day in college. Those who have moved away for the first time, you better get the lamp. God has given you His Word to get you to glory. Put it away and you're going to go off the path. and You're going to stumble and you're going to destroy yourself. And so saints of God, the Word... Let us be devoted to this Word, this lamp, to keep looking at it and studying it and letting it permeate my mind and my heart to journey to that day when I'm going to see the glory that Peter saw. Don't you want to see it? I wish I was there that day, but I can't wait. I'm going to see it. And it's full radiance when he returns. It's certain, is what Peter's telling us. In the Lord's table, he says, remember his death and do so until he comes again. And so as we come to this table, we're going to remember both. We're going to, by faith, look at both advents of Jesus Christ and all of his beauty. 
And as we close to go to the table, I just want to make one application and then we will come in. <clears throat> in this application, as I was thinking, in the last hundred years, the church has had an explosion in end times teaching. If you look at the, the, the history of the church, there's never been more emphasis on the end times than in the last hundred years. And it really came out of fundamentalism. And in fundamentalism, when it really sparked, it just renewed interest in prophecy like never before. And it was beautiful. It was, they were re realizing the second coming needs to be emphasized. It's fundamentalist. We, we believe in the return of Christ. And there was just so much time in the church given to it. And there were so many books that began to be written on the, the details of prophecy and how it would unfold and what it would look like. And then the world wars came, one and two, and everybody starts thinking, it's the end, it's the end, here we go, let's focus on this, let's get ready. And we got all of our charts and our maps and diagrams and people are now searching newspapers every day. Some people were spending more time in the newspaper than their Bibles, to figure out how this was going to unfold and is this story about this? Is that the Antichrist? And everybody's just living in this stuff. But I'm afraid the return of Christ has been greatly forgotten in our day. And the emphasis, again, is on the, the program and the agenda. But we have lost focus on the one who is coming back. We have lost sight of what Peter saw on that mountain and just longing for that glory and that beauty to come back. That's where Peter's heart is taken up. It's not with the charts, but it's with a person. Come, Lord Jesus. I want him. It's not for me to decode the mystery of his return. I got the little secret decoder and now I know when he's coming and what it's going to look like. That's not it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ coming in majesty and glory to make all things new, the consummation. Be looking, hastening, urging, come Lord Jesus. We have lost the bridegroom in our fancy with end times. Unbelievable. I share this story, but it's a true story and I'm going to share it again. As there was this, this young couple who had their first baby and they lived in a Boston suburb. And so they're having this little christening party for their little baby. And they invited all their friends and they're all just having the best time ever, drinking and having hors d'oeuvres and talking. And, and they're just talking about the baby and telling her labor stories. And, and it was just such a sweet time until someone finally said, oh, where's the baby? And she, she goes, I left him on the bed. And she ran into the bedroom and this little baby was smothered with all the jackets from all the guests that they had thrown on that bed. And so they're sitting there celebrating this baby why they smothered them with their jackets. And I don't see much difference in the church today. We talk all about how it's going to look, when he's coming, and we've lost the sweet Christ that we're to love and treasure and long for his appearing. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. We're more focused on the details than the person. Jesus said, I will come again that you may be with me and you with me. Peter the end meant one thing for Peter. The end is Christ. The end is the wedding supper with the Lamb of God, the Bridegroom of God. And we will dwell together forever with the Lord. I will come and receive you unto myself. We have lost the event and all of the surroundings. Is this your chief desire for the return of Christ for marital bliss with him? forever. Oh, so many people walk into this church and they'll say, what's your end times view? Kind of with this battery on their shoulder, I dare you to knock this off. Younger kids, it was a great commercial when I was growing up with Robert Conrad. Um, they want to argue and you want to make sure all of our charts line up. And Peter says, what kind of people ought you to be in holiness? And I want you to come and say, does your end times view produce holiness in the people of God? Is it producing urging and hastening and longing? Or is it just all theological? I want Christ. I want Christ so badly. No one asks that. Are you guys hastening and urging the return of Christ for one reason? Him. Is that your blessed hope? 
Are you ready? How do I get ready? Well, verses 1 through 11. I get ready by faith and being a partaker of the divine nature and finding, uh, instead of hoping in this world, I hope in the promises of God in Christ. And I keep growing in these things and I'm being diligent to, to have moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and all the things that we looked at so you can make certain you're calling an election. And that's how I get ready. How do I get ready? The sure word of God. I get ready by this. This is the sure word of God, and I don't read it like a story or a fable. Some of you say, of course it's not a story or a fable, and you treat it no differently. You read it, and it's like, oh, that was nice, and you go off, and nothing matters. This is it. This is the sure word of God. I read it like this is God speaking to me this very day, and it feeds me, and it fills me, and it gets me going. But don't look at it like it's a fable or a story. Don't say I got my theology right. This is inspired, and I treat it like it's a fable. This is the word of life. And because of the eyewitness that Peter had on the glory of the mountain. And so I ask you this morning, do you believe this word? Because what it tells us is that Christ came to earth in humility the first time to die a sinner's death. And we'll go to the table and remember the most amazing thing that has happened in this world. And then after we partake, we're going to lift our eyes in faith to what the first coming purchased for us, to a Savior who's going to come again for his bride. And Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, not in reference to sin this time, but in reference to salvation. For a salvation that will have a culmination for all who have loved his appearing. Let's join our hearts together and pray. Father, we thank you for this message from Peter. Thank you, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for that glory that he saw. I thank you that by faith I've seen that same glory. Oh God, it's killed everything about my own program. It's made me alive to that one that I've seen by faith. And so I thank you for the gift of faith. I thank you for opening my blind eyes and all the blind eyes in this room that have been opened to see that glory oh, of Jesus Christ. He's altogether lovely. And he's our hope and our desire. And we seek conformity to him. But most of all, we seek no longer to live by faith, but by the seen. Christ, would you come back for your bride that isn't perfect? Your bride that has to look through a lamp in the middle of all this darkness to see your glory and beauty. I thank you for the lamp. Oh, what this would be like without it. Thank you for the lamp. Let everyone in this room who's a believer treasure the lamp. Let us give our lives to the lamp to see, to see you and to see how to live for you and how to think about our trials and our future. God, we need this light. Let it shine. Use it in our lives, I pray. And I pray if there are any unbelievers in here, oh God, that they would never see that glory in their sin because it's a consuming fire. I pray don't let them stand before this blazing radiance thinking their own morality or religion or goodness could cover them. Oh God, if there are any in our place this morning who think that, let them repent right now. That light will burn up their own good works. I pray right now that they would look only to Jesus Christ, the one who went into the fire of your wrath and was consumed in our place, the one who bore the full wrath of God so we could only receive the full love and kindness of our God. O oh Lord, let them by faith look to this Christ and believe upon him and be saved this morning. I pray now, bless our time at the table. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.